Greetings, everyone. This is lesson five of the study we're doing into the Apostle Paul's letter to the churches at Galatia. Forgive me for my absence last week. As many of you know, we were in the path of Hurricane Ida, and things have been discombobulated uh, a bit here for the last 10 days or so. Thank you for your patience. Thank you uh, to everyone who reached out to check on Becky and to check on me and to check on um, the church here. Thank you to everyone who made a donation to, to aid in the recovery here. We're overwhelmed by your love. We're overwhelmed by the love that, that God has for us, that even though we, we might be spread, uh, spread out all over the, the entire earth, that, that God has been able to, to knit us together by, by the Spirit of our Lord Jesus. Just to, to remind everyone, the, the reason that we're, we, we set about to do these studies, the reason we're doing um, a study into the Apostle Paul's letter to the Galatians is that we, we want to see into Paul's heart and see why he wrote the letter and to see what was going on in his mind and what, what he was thinking when he wrote the letter. We, just to, to get a better idea of the intent that he had and the, the doctrine that um, he, he was trying to establish. You know, many times uh, we can think that the, the greatest problem for the, the church is the world around us um, and, and what's going on in the world around us. And I, I don't say that things are going uh, well in the world around us, but I think that the greatest problem for the church isn't what's going on in the world. I think the greatest problem for the church is the poverty of our understanding uh, of the scriptures. I think that the, the, the thing that ails the church the most is the poverty in our understanding of, of what the apostles were writing in their letters and the, the spirit behind uh, what everything they, everything they said and, and, and what it meant. You know, the, the, the Lord Jesus speaking to the Pharisees um, who read the scriptures more than anyone who studied the scriptures more than anyone, who uh, had committed the scriptures to, to memory and could uh, just quote uh, the, the scriptures verse by verse without any parchment or without having any Bible. And Jesus said to those guys, you do greatly err not knowing the scriptures. You know, when Jesus came talking to the Pharisees and to Jerusalem, he didn't come telling Jerusalem that uh, their, their biggest problem was Rome. He came telling Jerusalem that their biggest problem was that they, they didn't know God and that they didn't know the spirit of what was written in the scriptures. He, he said to the Pharisees, you do greatly err, not knowing the scriptures. And so we're, we're setting about to, to go through all the apostolic letters um, so that we could just get a revelation of, of what was in Paul's heart and what he was trying to establish, as well as what was in the apostles' hearts and what they were trying to establish in their letters. Um, and we, we finished off with uh, chapter 1, and I, I can't remember. We might have just started with um, chapter 2, but we'll, we'll pick it up with, with chapter 2. Um, it says, then 14 years after, Paul's talking to the Galatians, then 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised, and that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to or privately to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Um, okay. So what Paul's doing um, is he's continuing to establish the authority of his apostleship and the authority of the message that he, he preached and how they were both ordained um, of God himself. He's, he's developing a timeline. He's, he's retracing 
uh, the steps of his ministry and his interaction with uh, the apostles. Um, and he, he's doing that so that the churches in Galatia could, could be sh- certain that he, he's not lying to them about where he got his message and who sent him with his message. He wanted the Galatians to be absolutely certain that the things he said to them about his message and about his apostleship were, in fact, the truth. So he's running down his movements, and he's running down the the conversations. He's reliving the conversations that he had with the apostles and what those conversations were about. Um, if This is the, the first time that we see uh, Titus mentioned in, in the Scriptures. Uh, Titus is mentioned, I think, 15 times in the, the Pauline letters. Titus um, was a Greek, is a Greek, uh, a Greek guy, according to the flesh. Both his, his mother and his father were, were both Greeks. Paul um, fathered uh, Titus into the faith himself. I think you could find that in Paul's letter to Titus. I think he mentions how uh, he fathered uh, Titus uh, himself into the faith. Um, Titus was one of Paul's most uh, beloved and, and most trusted disciples. Uh, Paul, uh, after he established the, the church in, in Corinth, he, he uh, sent uh, Titus to Corinth to, um, to be the, the, the elder there or to, to be the pastor um, over that body there and, and to establish them in, in the faith um, of, of Jesus Christ. Uh, Titus, um, man, he, he loved Paul so much that he he's one of the the few guys that that actually went to see um, Paul when when he was in in jail. I, I I know we we talk all the time about Jesus when he when he was on the cross and when he was um, being uh, when he was brought in in front of the the Jewish uh, leaders and, and Pontius Pilate to answer for uh, what they said were his crimes. I know a lot of times we talk about John and, and Jesus' mother Mary, how they were the only ones that were there with Jesus. They were the only ones that uh, w- were still following Jesus when he was nailed to the cross. Well, listen, in the same way, Titus is one of the only guys who was, uh, who was faithful to the message Paul preached and, and faithful to uh, Paul's uh, apostleship, even when Paul was in jail. He went and saw Paul when he was in jail. Um, Paul says to uh, the Galatians that he, he went up to, to see the apostles by divine revelation. He, he didn't go to Jerusalem. Um, he wasn't reporting back to the apostles because the, it's the apostles that had, had sent him out. He wasn't uh, ministering under the authority of the apostles. He, he didn't go back to see the apostles because he was first sent by the apostles. Um, neither did, did Paul go to Jerusalem to, to get approval for the, the message that he preached. He wasn't uh, trying to find out if uh, his doctrine was correct. He, he wasn't looking for uh, validation of whether or not his message was, was true or not. But he was led by God to go up to Jerusalem. And the reason God led him to go up to Jerusalem was to stand in defense of the gospel of Jesus Christ. God himself, Paul says, led him up to Jerusalem to stand in defense of the message that justification is through the faith revealed in Jesus Christ and not the works which man can do through the strength of their own hands. Just as Paul would say in Acts 17 um, on Mars Hill, when he, he's preaching to the pagans there, and he says that, that God doesn't inhabit a temple that uh, man makes with their own hands. God doesn't come and dwell with man on account of the works which man can do with their own hands. It's not that man comes and builds something beautiful, and then God looks on what man builds and say, ah, that's nice, and then God now comes and sits with them. No, 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 no. It's not that way. Paul goes on to say, neither is God worshipped by the works which man can do for him. God who needs nothing. 
whose, uh, whose, whose throne is the heaven and the earth is his footstool. Man, God who needs nothing is not looking for man to do a work for him, but rather he's looking to come and tell man the work that he's done for them so that man could enter into the rest that comes from the work he's done to justify us through Jesus. Hallelujah. So Paul went to Jerusalem so that the message he preached to the Gentiles could be established once and for all as the only truth, the only truth that could uh, fill a person with the Godhead, the only truth that was unto godliness. And, and Paul says, Paul met with the, the apostles privately. The reason he met with the apostles privately is because he didn't want uh, his trip to Jerusalem to be in vain. When, when Paul talks about not wanting his labor to be in vain, he's not talking about um, the, the, the preaching that he did amongst the Gentile churches. What he's talking about is his trip um, that he took to Jerusalem by divine revelation. He didn't want that to uh, be in vain. He didn't want to go all the way to Jerusalem only to have the, the false brethren who had infiltrated the church there um, pretending to be believers. He, he didn't want to go all the way to Jerusalem only to have those guys uh, stir up everybody and uh, create an uproar and, and work everybody into a frenzy before he could uh, share the message that he preached with, with, with the other apostles. He, he, he didn't want those guys uh, causing chaos before he, he talked with the apostles. So he, he met with the, the apostles privately. Um, you know, I, I suppose it's not really so different today as it was then. Um, there's, it's still a, a big controversy um, amongst the church today. Um, about the works of the law, but but back in that day, there was a great controversy um, concerning the works of the law, and and many of the the Jewish people came from a background of being zealous for the works of the law, and the meeting, uh, if Paul hadn't met with the apostles privately, the meeting could have easily digressed into total chaos. Um, in fact, in in the book of Acts. You can find several instances where Paul Paul's meetings and uh, his preaching was was often disturbed by Jewish people that were zealous for the works of the law. So so Paul met with the apostles privately because he was looking to avoid that whole scene, and he was looking um, to establish the message he preached as the only truth um, that's unto godliness and, and unto justification. Um, listen, the Paul Paul talking about the, those uh, the Judaizers. He says these false brethren um, they crept they've crept into the body here. Uh, they they've looked on the body from the outside, and man, these guys are not liking the the freedom that we're living in. They're not liking that we're no longer carrying the heavy yoke uh, of trying to be justified by what we can do for God. They're not liking that instead of trying to be justified by our own works, that we're looking to the Father to justify us, free from our works through, through the Lord Jesus. These guys crept in, Paul says, pretending to be believers, but they are spots on our love feasts. Their mouths are full of the poison of asps. They have no interest in letting Jesus wash their feet, neither do they have any interest in in letting Jesus wash our feet, for that matter. As Paul says in, in Galatians 6, all these guys care about, the only reason why they, they want to infiltrate uh, the, our, our love feast, the only reason why they want to spy out our freedom is because they want to bring you back into bondage. They want to bring you back into the place where you're trying to prove that you're the children of God through your flesh. 
Their only interest is to bring you back into the bondage of trying to be justified through the strength of our own works so that they can glory in our flesh. They're glorying in their own flesh. They're glorying in the fact that they're Jewish according to the flesh. They're like the, the Pharisee that stood before God um, in, in, in the parable Jesus taught in Luke 18, and he stood there glorying in the works that he could do and instead of glorying in the inability of his flesh to do a work to justify him. These guys, their only interest is they're glorying in their own flesh in the presence of God, and they want to bring you into the place where they can glory in your flesh also. And Paul says, listen, man, that's where they're at. But all the while, um, our only interest is to glory in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our only interest is to behold Jesus on the cross and to see the inability of the flesh to glorify itself that we might be strengthened with the life of God. Paul says our only interest is the glory in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ that we could see that uh, the flesh doesn't possess the ability to justify us, that we could be strengthened with the very life of Christ. You know, Paul talks about the, the liberty um, that we have in Christ. And the, the liberty that we have in Christ is we're no longer sweating uh, from our own brow, trying to clothe upon ourselves with our own good works. We Rather, what we've done is we've taken Jesus's doctrine onto ourselves. We're walking in the Father's good work. As the scripture says, blessed are the meek, blessed are the poor in spirit, meaning blessed are those who uh, think little of their own works and their own strength to clothe upon themselves. Listen, man, we are the meek. The liberty we have is that we are the meek. We are the poor in spirit. We think much of the Father's ability to justify us with his life, and we think very little of man, the works of man to justify themselves. And so what's happened there is we've given up the ghost. We laid down the, the Adam life. We laid down the, the cursed life. We laid down the life where we're all the time laboring and toiling, trying to prove ourselves to be the children of God. We've laid down the kind of life where we're all the time trying to build ourselves a beautiful life and then take that life to God and, and get him to approve of us. We've laid, that down, we've laid down that kind of a life, and we see that God has judged us worthy of himself. He's judged us worthy of his life by sending Jesus. Hallelujah. So Paul says that, that Titus was um, with him when he met privately with the, the leaders of the Jerusalem church. And this is an important matter because the, the controversy with uh, the churches at Galatia um, was about the works of the law. And um, the, one of the pillars of uh, the works of the law are being justified through the works of the law is to be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin. And so the Judaizers, they come and said that uh, the apostles in Jerusalem are, are teaching that uh, you must still perform the works of the law to be justified. So Paul says, listen, I brought Titus up with me when I met privately with the leaders of the Jerusalem church. Um, and this is relevant and this is important. And, and Paul, uh, the reason Paul took Titus with him is because Titus was a Greek and he didn't have any Jewish descent and he wasn't circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. So Paul was like conducting an, a, a real-time experiment. Uh, not for himself and, and not for the apostles, but, but for the churches um, at Galatia so that the truth of the gospel could continue with them. And so Paul tells the Galatians um, who, who had been uh, deceived by the Judaizers into thinking that, that they had to perform the works of the law for justification and that, that God required for them to be circumcised in the flesh of their foreskin in order to be circumcised. Paul says that, that neither the apostles or any of the elders in the Jerusalem church 
uh, said anything uh, about Titus uh, not being circumcised. Neither did any of them compel Titus to be circumcised or even bring up that Titus should be circumcised. And the point Paul's making there is if the apostles, as the Judaizers had said, if the apostles believed uh, that Gentiles needed to be circumcised in order to be justified, why didn't they demand for Titus to be circumcised? They, they were well aware that Titus was a Greek guy. I mean, just the name Titus would tell them all that, that he was Greek. They knew that both of his father and his mother uh, were Greek. And yet Paul says they didn't compel him to be circumcised. You know, he just blew up the, the Judaizers' doctrine and, and revealed the deception um, and the deceit and the lies that uh, their message was built upon um, in one fatal pin stroke um, or feather stroke or whatever you want to call it um, there. Paul goes on to say in, in verse 5, to whom, speaking of the false brethren, the Judaizers, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, um, that the, the truth of the gospel might continue with you. So Paul met with them privately. He, he, he gave no place to the false brethren and their message that, that godliness was found through the strength of the flesh. He, he loved the lives of, of the Galatians. And really, for that matter, he, he loved the lives of the, the false brethren. Um, that's why he took a stand for the truth, uh, that, that they uh, might come to re repentance uh, and, and be saved by the, the life of Jesus. Paul, man, he cared so deeply about the Galatians that he, 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 wanted, he didn't want the truth of the gospel to be perverted in their eyes. So he gave no place to anything that the, the false brethren um, said. He was unyielding in his stance in Jerusalem. He was unyielding in his stance that justification, um, if you want to talk about circumcision and you want to talk about justification, uh, having anything to do with circumcision, Paul was unyielding in his stance that justification is found in the hearts of people being circumcised from looking to the strength they see in their flesh for justification, not in the circumcision of the flesh of the foreskin. Glory to God. You know, I thank God for the Apostle Paul and um, his diligence in the truth. And I thank God for the spirit of his grace that uh, upheld Paul's life in the midst of uh, all the persecution. And that, that even when Paul was weak, uh, that the grace of God continued with him. I thank God for that because we wouldn't have uh, the truth and know the truth that we we, we do today, if it wasn't for, for Paul um, committing his life into the hands of God and the hand of God upholding Paul's ministry uh, and causing the truth to continue in the face of, of all the persecution. You know, if you um, read uh, the account in, in Acts 16, um, well, let me back up a, a second there. Um, speaking of the circumcision uh, of Titus, there are uh, some who point to Acts 16, where, where Paul circumcises Timothy. And uh, they point to that situation, and they say that, that Paul, Paul, Paul taught that, that we must continue to perform the works of the law, even um, after Christ. They, they point to Paul, they say, why would Paul circumcise Timothy if Paul uh, wasn't teaching that we need to continue to perform the works of the law um, for, for justification. Simply put, the, the situation with Titus um, was, wasn't about being, or the situation with Titus, rather, was about being justified in the sight of God. And the, the situation with Timothy didn't have anything to do 
with God being happy with the state Timothy was in. And so both of those situations are completely different, and it's extremely relevant <laughs> as to how you're going to interpret those things. And, and, and real quick, just real quick, to be justified, because we've messed this up for a long time. Uh, we, we've taught the gospel as if God was personally offended with people, as if God rejected people, um, instead of teaching it as if God uh, rejected the state people were in, meaning God didn't reject people themselves. Uh, he rejected the state of death they were in because of the great love <laughs> that he has for people and uh, because of the fact that he, God was fully satisfied at the life he, he could share with people. This is the only thing he wasn't satisfied with is the state of death that, that, were, that people were in, which, which is why he, he had the cherubims, cherubims uh, guard the tree of life after Adam became joined with death uh, in order to prevent Adam from uh, living eternally in a state of death. Um, to, so real quick, to be justified um, in the sight of God isn't about God being happy with you because you've been a good boy or a good girl. It, it's not like God, uh, justification isn't about God looking down upon you because you've now performed the works of the law and he feels happy with you. Justification is about God being happy because uh, if, if you believe the testimony he's given in Jesus, you're possessing eternal life. And, and because God created you to be in a state of life where you, you are going to live eternally with him and never die, uh, the, the thing that justifies you in his sight or the thing that reveals you to be in the state that he desires for you to be in is for you to be in the state where you're standing, um, not just standing in the grace of Christ, but that you, uh, through faith, have Christ dwelling in you, and you have the incorruptible seed of God's life dwelling in you. That's what it means to be justified in the sight of God. It means for you to have the incorruptible seed that is Christ dwelling in you, and that justifies you in God's sight. It reveals you to be in the state that God created you to be in, the state that makes God happy, um, which is why the scriptures say that faith pleases God, because God desires for you to live and not die, and the only way that you can live and not die is through faith in the Lord Jesus. Um, I know I said real quick, I don't know uh, how, how quick that was, um, but if you, it's in Acts 16 where uh, it talks about Paul circumcising um, Timothy, and if you go and read Acts 16, Timothy wasn't compelled to be circumcised. Uh, the, there wasn't some type of situation or, or meeting where it was decided that Timothy needed to follow the works of the law and therefore he needed to be circumcised. There wasn't some type of uh, decision or doctrine preached that the only way to be justified is through circumcision. Or And so now Timothy must uh, be circumcised. It, Timothy wasn't circumcised as an act of obedience uh, to the law contained in, in carnal uh, commandments, Timothy was circumcised of his own free will. It was out of the liberty that he has in Christ he chose to be circumcised. Listen, man, as, a, as a, Timothy was a, a, a grown man, I, I know people say Timothy was young. Um, I don't want to argue about his age. Uh, for the sake of the argument, even if Timothy was 17, that's quite grown and to come and be circumcised now um, at the age of 17 when uh, no one is telling you that you need uh, circumcision in order to have eternal life. Listen, man, it, the only way you could do a thing like that is if uh, you're already possessing eternal life and you don't think that your life can be harmed. Um, amen? <laughs> uh oh, glory to God. So then why, why, was, why did Timothy... Uh, offer to be circumcised? Why did he desire to be circumcised? Um, well, if you keep reading the, the scriptures there, Paul was going to uh, minister to, to Jewish people in the area, and Timothy was going with him 
to minister. The, the Jewish people in the region, they knew Timothy. They knew that his, while his mother was Jewish, they knew that his, his father was Greek. And, and neither uh, Paul or Timothy wanted his Greek background to be a stumbling block uh, for the Jewish people. They, they didn't want uh, circumcision and uncircumcision to, to take center stage. They didn't want the message of grace to uh, get lost in, in all the discussion about circumcision and uncircumcision. They, they wanted to remove, I mean, there's enough of a stumbling block with the, the message of the cross. And so they didn't want to add fuel to the fire. Uh, Timothy was preferring the life of the Jewish people over his own life. He, he, he didn't see that circumcision could harm his life because his life was secure in Christ. And so he cared more about the Jewish people that were perishing and their ability to hear the message of grace. As, as Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians 9, um, speaking of himself, um, that uh, he became all things to all people, that he might win the more to Christ. That same spirit was born in Timothy, where uh, he, he desired to become all things to all people, that he, he might win the, the more to Christ. Um, listen, Timothy and Paul both knew that, that justification isn't found in being circumcised, but they also both knew that justification isn't found in uh, being uncircumcised either. And so they didn't want the central issue of their meetings or their ministry. They didn't want the central questions about the things they said to be circumcision or uncircumcision. They wanted the opportunity for Christ to be clearly put on display in the midst of the people. They wanted the people to hear clearly that justification was found in death being overcome in the flesh, and it was found in possessing the very life of God, the life that manifested in the man Jesus. They wanted that to be clearly put on display in front of the people so that the people could hear the faith. They didn't want the people, to, the Jewish people who were circumcised, to think that their message was all about being uncircumcised. Can you imagine these guys who were circumcised? And, and now they think that justification is found in, in not being circumcised. Man, that's a, a difficult thing for them. Um, I mean, God can perform miracles, and I guess he could have put back the flesh of their foreskin. But that's a hard saying um, for people who have already been circumcised if they think justification is found in not being circumcised. So Paul and those guys, Paul and Timothy, they didn't, they, they didn't want the people to now think that justification was found in being uncircumcised. Um, and the, you could see similar instances of this uh, in, in different places in, in, in the Scriptures, and, and particularly in the Apostle Paul's letters. You can see the same kind of thing in Paul's letter to the Romans where he addresses uh, the issue of eating uh, meat sacrificed to idols. He tells the Gentiles, listen guys, it's true that eating meat offered to idols can't defile you. It, it's true that you don't have to avoid eating meat offered to dumb idols as if the idols are alive and the idols can now harm you. But let us not live as if justification is found in our freedom to eat the meat that's offered to idols. We, we know that uh, we're not counted as sinners for eating meat that's been offered to idols, but let us not live as if now our justification is found in the freedom to eat meat offered to idols, lest the conscience of our Jewish brethren be defiled or be corrupted. You know, I just want to say this. Because we can see that uh, we're not justified by performing the works of the law, but then we can kind of adopt the, the other side of the coin, and we can think that justification is found in not performing the works of the law or in not doing anything uh, that the law might talk about. Listen, justification isn't wrapped up in not doing what I don't have to do. Neither is it wrapped up in doing that which I am free to do. True freedom, listen, listen carefully, true freedom isn't found 
in doing what you are able to do or in not doing what you don't have to do. There's a lot of things you don't have to do. But freedom isn't found in you all the time proving that you don't have to do them. True freedom, true freedom is found in the revelation that the power behind you experiencing life isn't hid in whether you are circumcised or not. True freedom is found in the power behind you experiencing life. True freedom is found in that the power behind you experiencing life isn't found in whether you eat the meat offered to idols or you don't eat the meat offered to idols. You don't need to prove that you're free to eat the meat offered to idols. And in fact, if you uh, think you have to eat the meat offered to idols to prove your freedom, you're not dwelling in freedom at all. Really, you're just in bondage. And um, what's going on there is uh, if our liberty is dependent on doing what we're free to do, or if our liberty is dependent on not doing what we are free not to do, uh, it's, it's just the bondage. And, and we're, we're, we're building again uh, the, the very thing that we were so zealous in, in tearing down. It's, it's, the same, uh, it's the same kind of a doctrine that's taught um, in the idea that we have to perform the works of the law to be justified. It's, it's just the other side of the same coin. Glory to God. So let us rejoice that our freedom and our liberty and uh, our life is not wrapped up in uh, what we do or don't do, but it's wrapped up in the glorified man, Jesus Christ. Um, let's see. We have a few more minutes. We'll move on. We'll go on. Um, verse 6 of chapter 2. But of these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. God accepts no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me towards the Gentiles. And when James, uh, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. Okay. We'll finish up with uh, these five verses. Um, you know, as you go through the letters, and you read individual verses, you, you, you want to be reminded that uh, those verses aren't just being said out of the clear blue sky. Uh, those verses are being said in light of everything that was said prior to that. It's building upon it. So we want to remember Paul isn't making uh, this statement out of the blue. He, he's speaking uh, in reference to the, the situation involving the, the Judaizer. Um, when he talks about the reputation of the apostles. The, the Judaizers exalted the apostles over Paul in the eyes of the Galatians. They come in and uh, made the apostles of uh, reputation, of a good reputation, and they come in and, and made it out as if Paul's uh, reputation was, uh, uh, he was of Ill, rep Ill refute, that his reputation wasn't good, and uh, that it wasn't, not only was it not equal to the other apostles, but it, he, he didn't stand in the same authority as the other apostles. So that's what Paul is getting after. Paul isn't tearing down. Uh, when Paul says, it matters, uh, it matters not to me uh, their reputation, uh, God is no respecter of persons. Um, it's true, God isn't a respecter of persons, but Paul isn't tearing down the apostles and he's not tearing down their, their authority to establish sound doctrine. Um, he's not trying to establish himself as being above the apostles. Um, but, but what he's doing is he's, he's merely making the point that just because those guys were apostles before him, and just because they were known by the people um, to have walked with Jesus uh, when Jesus was alive 
uh, in the earth b- before the, the cross and the resurrection. He's just making the point that uh, that doesn't mean the grace that was given to those guys is any greater than the grace that was, was given to him. And so Paul met with the pillars of the church. He met with those who were uh, reputed to be above him in authority concerning the mystery that was revealed in Christ Jesus. He went and met with those guys who the Judaizers said were up here and that he was down here. And Paul tells the Galatians after meeting with those guys and upon meeting with these guys who were uh, perceived to be pillars in the church, um, he tells the Galatians that those guys didn't add anything to his doctrine when he met with them privately in Jerusalem. They didn't see any gaps in his message, and they they didn't need to fill in in the blanks for Paul so that his message could be complete. Uh, they they didn't hear Paul's uh, they didn't hear what Paul said and then say to him, "Yeah, yeah, that's very nice, but one thing your message lacks." Um, it it wasn't that way at all. It wasn't um, the it wasn't like it was with uh, Apollos. I I think it's in Acts 18. It wasn't the way that it was with Apollos, where Apollos was uh, fervent uh, in spirit, and he was diligently uh, teaching the things of Jesus in the synagogues. But um, Apollos didn't uh, understand. He hadn't heard the entire message yet. And the only thing that Apollos knew uh, was about the the baptism of John. And Acts 18 says that uh, Aquila and, and Priscilla heard Apollos teaching in, in the synagogues, and uh, they, they, they went and grabbed them to themselves, and they expounded um, unto Apollos the, the way of God more perfectly. And so Paul's telling the Galatians, it wasn't like it was with Apollos. Man, my message was complete. And the apostles, who were said to be of a, uh, a greater esteem when it come to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus, uh, those guys didn't add anything to my doctrine. Uh, Paul goes on to tell the Galatians, contrary wise, and in fact, when John and Peter and, and, and James, when, when they heard uh, my message, Paul says, when they heard his message, they saw that his words were full of grace. They saw that his communication wasn't corrupt. They saw that the words that came out of his mouth were seasoned with grace, and when they saw the grace that came out of Paul's mouth, they perceived that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed into his hands by God, just as uh, the the gospel of the circumcision or the gospel uh, to the circumcision was committed into the hands of Peter. And so, listen, Paul's still addressing... I know some of you are like, can we get to some doctrine, man? We're going to get to the doctrine. The latter part of the letter is full of doctrine. Um, Paul is still addressing uh, the, the issue of his, uh, his authority as an apostle here, not because he wants to lord it over uh, the Galatians' faith, but he wants the truth of the gospel to continue with them so they can be partakers with him uh, and with God in, in God's joy. And so Paul tells the Galatians, listen, guys, not only, this is really going to destroy the Judaizers' uh, doctrine and what they said about Paul. Paul says, listen, not only did the other apostles not add anything to his doctrine, when they heard him preach, um, when they heard him talk, remember, I think it's, I don't remember which verse it is in chapter 1, but back in chapter 1, Paul says he was called to be an apostle to the Gentiles by the grace of God. Back in chapter 1, Paul said that the power behind his apostleship to the Gentiles is uh, the Father himself. If you, if you look at the, the other apostles, if you look at Peter, if you look at James, if you, you look at John, if you... Uh, look at, at any of those guys, uh, Matthew, um, all those guys were, were called to be apostles by grace. It, they were also called by grace. And so when, when Paul says that the other apostles perceived the grace given to him 
what, what he's getting at, what he's trying to tell the Galatians is not only did the apostles not add anything to his doctrine, but the other apostles recognized that he was ordained by God to be the apostle to the Gentiles, just as Peter was ordained by God to be the apostles to the Jews. Paul wants the Gentiles to, to, to know, even the apostles, whom the Judaizers exalted to be something more than him, even those apostles, they acknowledged Paul's authority in the mystery that was revealed in Christ. Those guys saw the, the, the grace of God was working mightily in Paul, and that God, those guys, those apostles, acknowledged that Paul had been set apart by God himself uh, for the preaching of the gospel, for, for the obedience to the faith amongst the Gentiles, just as Peter, um, just as God had, was working mightily in Peter for the preaching of the gospel, for the obedience to the faith amongst the, the Jewish people. Glory to God. Glory to God. Verse 10. I think we'll, we'll read verse 10 again. Um, let's see. Let's see. I think, yeah, well, verse 10. Um, the only, only, verse 10 says, only they would that we should remember the poor the same which I also was forward to do. Okay, now listen, um, if any of us read Paul's letters and study uh, his writing style and his doctrine, what we know about the Apostle Paul is that he pays great attention to detail in what he says. Um, his uh, one sentence is chocked full of a, a year's worth of preaching. And so in the spirit of Paul not wanting to leave out anything, in the spirit of Paul's attention to detail and him being very thorough and always precise in his words, what he says in verse 10 here is he tells the Galatians, um, the other apostles, they, they didn't add anything to him or his revelation. The, the only thing that they had to say, their only request was that uh, Paul remember the poor. And, and Paul says, which he was already doing, um, that just as those guys had a heart for the poor, uh, Paul's heart was filled with compassion um, for the, the, Paul, the poor also. And so he was already um, purposing to remember the poor. Now, listen, um, the, I, listen you, you can uh, be generous towards anybody who's poor. Um, you, you, I encourage you. Uh, to to give to to anyone that you feel led to give uh, to the disadvantaged or the disenfranchised. Glory to God, uh, man. Um, we know that we we've been filled with the abundance of God's life, and and we lack no good thing. Um, and so, if we feel a desire to give unto anyone who's poor, man, we can uh, we're free to to follow um, that desire. Uh, with that being said, with with reference to this verse, the poor there is referring to the, the church at Jerusalem who uh, were, were outcasts of their own society, and uh, they were suffering pers persecution um, for believing on Jesus. And if you go and, and, and read in Acts chapter 11, there's a guy named Agabus, a prophet. Um, and listen, just real quick to, to describe, I say real quick all the time, it's never real quick, is it? Um, when it says that Agabus is a prophet, it doesn't mean that he's functioning in the office of a prophet. When it says Agabus was a prophet, it just means that, man, by the Spirit of God, the Spirit moved as the Spirit willed, and the Spirit showed Agabus something about this one matter. It doesn't mean that Agabus was now a uh, someone that was set apart by God to establish doctrine in the church, okay? So you have uh, the office of a prophet, which Paul and John and James and Peter and Matthew and all the apostles functioned in the office of uh, a prophet or the prophet, meaning that the, the primary function of a prophet is to establish the doctrine of Jesus Christ. You have that kind of a prophet mentioned in the scriptures. And then you also have 
uh, the word prophet just being used as someone who has a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge about a one specific matter, but they're not to be exalted in the eyes of the people as someone who is a discerner of the doctrine of Christ or a discerner of the oracles that were revealed in Christ. Okay, so this guy Agabus in Acts 11, he comes along and he says there's going to be great dearth in the land, uh, which, you know, dearth could be that there's a famine, uh, that there's hard times in the land. Um, and what it, what it goes on to say is it could be persecution. Uh, what it goes on to say is the, the disciples um, were determined to send relief to the saints in Judea um, upon hearing this word. And what those disciples did is with, they, they took up an offering and they gathered an offering um, and they gave it to Paul and Barnabas because as the scripture, as Paul just said, uh, Paul also purposed to remember the poor saints in Jerusalem. So Acts 11 says the disciples took up an offering. They gave it to Paul and Barnabas and then Paul and Barnabas passed it along to the elders um, in Jerusalem. You, you know, you can read about Paul taking up an offering for the poor saints, the, the same thing that, that he's mentioning here um, in, in his letter to the Galatians. He, he mentions it several times in, in his letters um, about taking up an offering for the poor saints in Jerusalem. Um, I think 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9 uh, come to mind immediately um, where Paul's talking about uh, giving from uh, freedom instead of giving being born from an external commandment saying that we must give. Um, that whole uh, conversation, that whole explanation that Paul gives in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 is in reference to uh, remembering the poor saints in Jerusalem. Well, glory to God, guys. I don't know exactly how long I, I went for. Um, I might have gone long. We'll finish up there. Um, this next week, I am going to be in Tulsa, um, hanging out with some dear friends and, and people that are part of the fellowship here. We'll be there just gathering, talking Jesus. Um, I'm going to try to uh, record Lesson 6 before I go so that it can still be posted. Uh, you guys, just please have mercy on my soul. If I'm unable to get to it, I'll do my best to get to it. But if not, I will pick it back up, and I will be diligent um, in continuing in these messages. Um, I'm getting so much out of it that woe is me if I stop doing it. Glory to God. God bless. I love all you guys. Um, may you be kept by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ.